thank you very much. This uh, next session is uh, now extant. I am uh, Kamal Ahmed, the business editor of the BBC. Uh, welcome to uh, Philippe Dalman, to Cambridge, the sunshine capital of Britain. Um, <laughs> hope you're enjoying sure the, uh, the fabulous, fabulous uh, weather. President and CEO, too big a character in the media to simply have one title, your president and chief executive uh, officer. Um, since September 2006, obviously a former director of uh, CBS, came up through the law and finance route to, uh, to your present role. Obviously, make any journalist uh, incredibly nervous, uh, the fact that you uh, have such expertise in those two areas. Also, as well, being a great philanthropist, uh, 2009 doing Get School with the Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation. Uh, we're going to have a wide-ranging uh, discussion about why this behemoth uh, of the media decided to buy a rather small UK broadcaster for some uh, reason. But Philippe, you're gonna kick us off with a few thoughts of your own. Sure. Philippe. Thank you. Thank you, Kamal. I appreciate your kind introduction. And uh, thank you to the Royal Television Society and the BBC for the invitation to be here and address this important audience. A year into Viacom's expanded presence in the UK, I am happy to report that there has been relatively little in the way of intrigue or drama. <laughs> the BBC has really taken the spotlight in that regard. Not that we haven't had some anxious moments. As you may know, our Mission Impossible 5 was filmed here in the UK. In the film, everyone's favorite spy, Ethan Hunt, played by Tom Cruise, has an inauspicious encounter with the British Prime Minister played by Tom Hollander. For those of you who have seen it, and I hope all of you have, you know it turns out fine in the end, as it did for us. No prime ministers were harmed in the making of this film. <laughs> Only bad guys and relations between our two countries are as strong as ever. Viacom has certainly been a beneficiary of that special relationship. We've had a presence in this vibrant media market for nearly 30 years, beginning in 1987, when MTV first set up shop here. The UK creative industries have always been a fount of creativity for us and our most important source of original content outside the US. We employ over 1,000 people here, 10% of our global workforce, and many more people in our productions, and base our international creative leadership for both MTV and Comedy Central here in the UK. Including Channel 5, Viacom is today the third largest commercial broadcaster in terms of ratings with a balanced portfolio of free-to-air and pay TV programming that appeals to all British audiences, whatever their age, gender, or background. That said, Viacom programming finds its full voice with young audiences. Nickelodeon, MTV, Comedy Central, BET, <coughs> even Spike, connect with the kid in all of us, which places us on the leading edge of changing viewer preferences on not only what is watched, but how it is watched in markets around the world. So let me give you the view from our youth-informed perch on how media consumption is altering our business. Unlike the stark choice presented by our organizers, Happy, Fa Happy Valley or House of Cards, what we see is a very solid house in a healthy, if not always happy, valley. What makes television, television, that is the content, is here to stay. Let's not confuse medium with message. Whatever the screen, People are watching more video content, a lot more than ever. However, it is undeniable that the media industry in the US and around the world is in a period of transition. While some of the specific implications may be less relevant here in the UK with its strong public service broadcasting culture, the trend is clear. The revenue models that are being challenged in the US will also come under increasing pressure here as the digital revolution continues to transform viewing habits. It is also clear that the way forward 
is inevitably up. Audiences the world over are hungry for the high quality content we all produce. Digital technologies provide us and our advertisers with a way to connect more immersively and directly with our audiences that is unprecedented and extremely valuable. This year's MTV Video Music Awards in the US, as an example, generated enormous engagement, more than 73 million views across platforms. Far from usurping our role, these new digital platforms extend our reach, increase our exposure, and place a premium on our production, curation, and editorial expertise. So the primary challenge before us, and, that, and one that we at Viacom are addressing head on, is to craft new, more accurate methods to measure and monetize that audience engagement with our content across all platforms. It is an issue that we as an industry need to address collectively. And while it may take time, I have every confidence that we will find a solution. Working toward that solution is one part of Viacom's strategy as a global media company. There are three prongs to that strategy. One, continually increase our investment in outstanding creative content and deliver it to consumers when they want it, wherever they want it. Two, continue to build international scale and capabilities. And three, apply technology-driven innovation to both expand distribution and pioneer new advertising platforms. First, content. At Viacom, culture-defining content for young audiences is our legacy, and it will continue to define our future. Our audiences are the pioneers on the digital frontier, and as they venture onto new distribution platforms, the content that fuels their exploration will become even more valuable. It's not the journey, it's the destination that matters, and our programming is the destination. That truth should be self-evident. Therefore, we are significantly increasing and are continually accelerating our already considerable investment in original programming at Viacom. From full-length movies to original series of 10-second episodes on Snapchat and everything in between. We've never spent more than we do today, including here in the UK. When I became CEO of Viacom in 26, 2006, we spent less than $2 billion on programming worldwide. Today, that number tops $4 billion annually and is growing each year. The UK, in general, is a production and commissioning hub for Viacom globally. It's here where we commission new shows for MTV and Comedy Central internationally, including, by the way, from Channel 5 Productions. The instant success of new shows such as Tut and Lip Sync Battle on Spike and the enduring popularity of our Shore franchise as examples confirm the wisdom of our unprecedented investment in content and fuel our global ambitions. Tut, starring Sir Ben Kingsley, a rating success in the US, debuted here on Channel 5 on August 1st and 2nd and increased ratings in its weekend time slot by 74%. Lip Sync Battle, a concept that features celebrities competing head to head by lip syncing a song of their choice, quickly rose to number one in its initial run on Spike in the US. It is already the most watched original series in the network's history, not to mention an overnight internet sensation. The UK version of Lip Sync Battle is already in development with UK producers and celebrities, and local versions of the show have been optioned in 22 other media markets around the world, from China to Chile to the Czech Republic. Today, Nickelodeon's SpongeBob SquarePants appears in more than 185 countries, in 50 languages, on our own branded channels, and through syndication to 175 third-party broadcasters globally. Geordie Shore, meanwhile, is our highest rated franchise internationally and in MTV UK history. It has spawned three more successful shores in Acapulco, Spain's Gandia, and Warsaw. 
and there isn't even a shore in Warsaw. <laughs> Coming soon, we will bring the cast of Acapulco and Gandia together in a fourth series called, what else? Super Shore. So the second, sprung of, of, the second prong of Viacom's global strategy is to build international scale and capabilities. And there again, the acquisition of Channel 5 has been a huge leap forward. Viacom is now in the enviable position of being the second largest privately held commercial media networks group in the UK. And as you know, the UK is the fastest growing developed economy outside the US. We are also one of the four major players in the world's fastest growing developing market, India. In fact, no other network group is growing faster in India than Viacom 18, which now has 10 national channels, including MTV, Nickelodeon, Comedy Central, and Colors, a popular Hindi general entertainment brand. And we just acquired a 50% interest in Prism TV, which owns and operates popular regional entertainment channels there. Prism gives us a significant presence in this rapidly evolving TV sector in India, where almost 60% of the population speaks a regional dialect. We've also undergone major expansion in Africa, where we already have the largest presence of any global media networks company. And in Latin America and Asia, all markets with enormous room for growth. Viacom today reaches a cumulative 3.4 billion television subscribers worldwide, and we have the knowledge and experience of a company that has been on this global journey for a long time. Capturing the vast opportunities outside the US was one of my first initiatives when I became CEO in 2006, and it remains a core priority in terms of propelling Viacom's continued relevance and growth. The third and final element of our strategy is all about innovating. Bringing new distribution and advertising technologies that deliver fresh entertainment experiences and enhanced value to audiences and advertisers. Our programming is carried around the world by digital distributors like Netflix, Amazon, and Hulu, cable providers such as Virgin Media, Comcast, Time Warner, Telefonica, and Multi-Choice International, and satellite companies like Sky, Dish, DirecTV, and CanalSat, just to name a few. And that doesn't include short-form content that we provide to digital media apps such as Snapchat, YouTube, Instagram, Vine, and others. These partnerships require not only technological sophistication, but also organizational agility and speed. And then there's the burgeoning mobile market. We were one of the first to sign a programming deal with Verizon, the largest wireless carrier in the States. And just last week, we announced the international launch of Viacom Playplex, a suite of mobile TV apps that will allow our distribution partners in all 180 countries we serve to engage consumers with our content on their smartphones and tablets. On the advertising front, technology, particularly the power of data, is revolutionizing how we interact with advertisers. Viacom is again taking the lead with a suite of services in the US that help our marketing partners connect with the millennial audiences that flock to Viacom's networks and are largely unmeasured by traditional rating mechanisms. So we've introduced Viacom Vantage, an industry-leading ad effectiveness tool with powerful targeting and predictive capabilities that goes far beyond traditional demographic targeting. By integrating proprietary and third-party data on more than 100 million US individuals, we provide advertisers with a much clearer picture of exactly who they are reaching so they can customize their message to reach that precise audience. We also have a number of other innovative ad solution products that fully leverage the 650 million social media fans who follow our portfolio of brands. Through these innovations, Viacom can offer advertisers opportunities to reach their target audiences that no one else can. So with the two minutes I have remaining, let me present Viacom's end of term report on our first year as a British public service broadcaster. 
I had the pleasure and honor of being here in Britain a year ago when Viacom became the first American media company to own a UK terrestrial public service broadcaster. Today, I am pleased to reaffirm our commitment to upholding the rights and responsibilities that entails. We pledged when we bought Channel 5 that we would increase investment in original creative content. We have and will continue to do so. The programming budget for Channel 5 should see a double digit percentage gain in the 2015-2016 broadcast year. Currently, well over 10% of Viacom's global content spend of $4 billion goes to buying and commissioning programming for our UK channels, including Channel 5. As for our public service commitments regarding news and UK originated content, we've not only met but far exceeded all. In fact, we've agreed with Ofcom to increase Channel 5's annual peak news quota by 20% and our UK originated content quota to 45% from 40%. We have also renewed our guarantee to broadcast at least 600 hours of UK originated children's programs every year for the duration of Channel 5's 2015 through 2024 license, an annual quota which we are once again comfortably exceeding. Indeed, our term report shows a busy and productive year at Channel 5. We've grown our share of viewing among 16 to 34-year-olds. We've shared and cross-promoted a growing volume of content with Viacom's pay channels, including 10,000 BC, Celebrity Big Brother, Tut, MTV's EMA Awards, and a broad array of preschool and children's programming. We've successfully launched the Spike UK network as part of Channel 5's portfolio, and we've built a more solid foundation for future revenue and profit growth by striking a new wholesale advertising arrangement with Sky Media. And we'll be no less productive in the year ahead as we refresh the Channel 5 on-air brand, expand production in the UK to strengthen our portfolio of 30 UK TV channels, and extend the quality and range of entertainment to deliver even more value to UK television audiences. The global media market is at a pivotal juncture right now, and speaking for my colleagues at Viacom, we are very comfortable in the vanguard. We always will be. Since the early days of cable in the US, we've been first in recognizing and capitalizing on the trends driving media consumption. We have our young audiences to thank for that. Being the forefront of so many a media transformation, we have learned to discern truth from hyperbole and seize early advantage. The very digital technologies that others see as an immediate threat to our traditional business model, we see as a powerful long-term opportunity to architect an even more robust and rewarding future. The digital revolution is far more promising than it is perilous. I can confidently report from the front that the digital revolution will be televised. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Philippe, for that um, very illuminating sort of overview of Viacom's view of the world. Obviously, you touched on Channel 5 an awful lot um, in your words. Some people at the, at the outset of that deal uh, becoming public and then being executed uh, might have thought to themselves, uh, what is Viacom doing? Uh, uh, buying a free-to-air public service broadcaster in linear television at a time when surely the future of television is all about online and on demand. Um, how have you dealt with that type of criticism and with the, um, uh, the notion that was it just to have some form of ad sales deal and how concerned were you about Viacom's ad sales position in the UK. You touched on the Sky Media deal. How much was that part of your thinking about Channel 5 being actually a battering ram to help your other services that you already have in the UK? Well, when we looked at Channel 5 initially, we started by looking at the content opportunity. That's, that's our lens through which we look at everything. And uh, we saw that it had a very successful children's block in, in Milkshake. Uh, and uh, Milkshake, of course, uh, penetrates the entire UK, whereas pay television only uh, penetrates uh, a part of it. 
Uh, and so we saw the potential cross-promotion, uh, cross-marketing, cross-programming opportunities just on the kids' side, and that was very special to us. Uh, we looked at the uh, programming budget, uh, and uh, the team there had done a good job of building up Channel 5 over the last few years. We thought we could take it to the next level by, uh, by applying what we know how to do best, by changing the mix. I talked about increasing our spending by double-digit percentage for next year, after increasing it, by the way, this past year. Uh, but the mix is also changing. There will be an even greater increase in commissioned programming uh, as part of that. So uh, th this is part of our move to have more and more original programming that can play across platforms. Channel 5, by the way, has a very advanced video on demand platform in Demand 5. It works really well. The, the amount of views is increasing dramatically on there. And in fact, uh, we're our technology people are looking at it to see what we can learn uh, from it. So, th so that's, that's where we started. And of course, it also gave us scale in the UK. Uh, we think the UK is a great market. We've been here almost 30 years. We're familiar with it. We had good relations with the regulators here. Uh, it, it, we're, we're comfortable with the creative community. And we thought we could build on it and, and, and build on it so that we can expand our regional into Europe and, and worldwide scope. And the proof of that is that we shortly after we bought Channel 5, we were able to begin to fulfill a dream of mine, which was to start Spike outside of the US. And having Channel 5 together, its programming together with the US-based programming, allowed us to jumpstart the international Spike brand, which we are now talking to distributors about rolling it out ac across the world. So. Um, we're particularly pleased that it's actually uh, worked out so well to this point, and we see a lot of room for growth here in the UK. We're very excited about it. Is it was it a, an opportunistic buy-in that Richard Desmond was obviously uh, a seller, or is it the start of something that Viacom wants to do in other territories also, or even extend what it is doing in the UK with other opportunities? Well, you know, we, we, we are very careful in acquisitions. Uh, we, we, we do a thorough analysis of it. We prefer to grow organically. We, we've been, uh, we started out internationally with the MTV brand, which we expanded around the world. Then we added the Nickelodeon uh, brand, which is now global, then Comedy Central. Uh, we launched, we created the Paramount Channel outside of the US. We don't have one in the US. And, and as I mentioned, we're expanding Spike. We started Colors in India from scratch. And it's been the number two or number one rated Hindi language channel in India since the second month after we launched, six years ago. So we prefer to build, but uh, in the international arena in particular, we look at opportunities where it fits uh, to add to our portfolio to get that scale. We're not per se looking for broadcasting properties. It just happened to be the opportunity that presented itself, uh, and uh, we seized on it. You've talked a lot about content, original content, of course, being particularly uh, important. Uh, John Langruff has spoken about this sort of tsunami of content, that actually there's a content glut and there's going to be a collapse. You could look at it as being similar to the oil price. In the end, there's just too much content. You're all plowing into um, original content. There are, of course, big successes with some of that. I mean, how dangerous do you think it is? Or do you agree with John's uh, opinion that there is a possible crisis ahead where too many uh, bets are made on original content. There just isn't the room in the broadcasting ecology. There's never enough good original content. There, there's a lot more original content, but finding that, that cultural uh, hit is a very special thing to accomplish. And, and uh, you have to take a lot uh, you, have to, you have to try a lot of new things. You, you have to, you can look, uh, you had somebody from YouTube here earlier, you can find on YouTube the, uh, some of the new talent, and the, uh, the first thing they aspire to is to have their own TV show. So we, we, we have a lot more opportunities to discover talent today than we did before, but it's very hard to have everything gel together into a hit. One of the advantages of creating original programming, apart from it being brand-defining, 
Yeah, we, we How organize... important is that to have this, the brand notion that people understand where their programming is coming from? They know your name much more clearly. There's a linkage in people's minds when they're yeah, watching. It's very important to have, uh, and our brands have evolved over time, but when people go on Comedy Central, they know, uh, and they can go there casually because they know it's to watch something funny. And, um, and if we license a show that, was, that aired on broadcast several years ago and we're committed to 150 episodes and it doesn't repeat well, doesn't play well, we're stuck paying the bill. Now, I'd prefer to allocate the kind of money that's involved in that where possible to try eight original shows I can do six episodes, 10 episodes. If several of them fail, as they inevitably will, we can stop production. And the one that works, we keep pushing it. And so we, we, we're able to not only have a better brand defining product that way, uh, but we have more opportunities for great success. And that's been our philosophy. You go through periods where you're hot or cold, uh, but over time, it's, it's something that will work. And with the international growth in media, in, in new places, with the multiplicity of new technologies, which allows you to penetrate markets we were previously not able to penetrate, particularly where there's a lot of regulation on traditional broadcasting. We're not allowed to own a network in our neighbor, Canada. It's right next to us. But the law prevents us from controlling a network. We're limited to 25% ownership. But what we can do is we can license our content to SVOD players over there. Uh, there are some countries where there's no ownership allowed. Again, we can penetrate on mobile. So for us, it's very exciting because we own a lot of content. We had thousands upon thousands of hours of shows we produced for MTV, Nickelodeon in the old days. We didn't have a traditional syndication market. All of a sudden, the SVOD players show up. And there you go, we have found money, which we can plow into other content. So our philosophy has, has always been, and, and articulated by, by Sumner since the time he bought the company, content is king. There's always a new use for it. We can format it. Uh, Geordie Shore was Jersey Shore, and then it, it begat other uh, How shows. important is that scalability, that ability to reformat programs to loads and loads of different markets? like Warsaw Shore, even places which don't have a shore. <laughs> yeah, and, and by the way, the, the production costs are pretty low uh, <laughs> yeah. over there. So it, it's just, it, 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 just, it just becomes a brand. It becomes a brand. Yeah. And, uh, and when you find it, you, you ha that's where you can monetize it. It's that, it's that monetization. It, it's like the movie business. We all know we make movies, and uh, we have the great script, we think. We have the great stars, we thank the great director, and something goes wrong, or just by the time it gets in theaters, it doesn't work. And sometimes you get lucky, uh, and, and ten, all 10 of your releases in a row make, make a lot of money. Some years, none work. But on average, one out of 10 will make you money. But you still go at it, and you, and you go for it, and overall, it's a good business. You build the library. And the real value in owning a, a Hollywood studio, we've owned ours, uh, it's, our, it's the oldest one in Hollywood over a century, is that library. It allowed us to create a new international channel, the Paramount Channel, ad-supported, which is a huge hit that gets us into new demos and increases our scale around the world. We're already in over 60 countries. So there are always new uses for great content. So I, I, I would disagree that there's too much television uh, you have to be smart in where you allocate your money, but uh, I think there's never enough good television or good movies because when you have it, you can combine them, disaggregate them, and uh, find different ways to make money. And that's why we announced with Snapchat the week before last in the U.S., the five Comedy Central original series. Big announcement. Ten seconds each episode. So we have people who, in-house, in who are doing that, and, and all the new content companies, they come to us. They want to work with us. There are a lot of complementary ways we can work with each other. How much of a threat to your business model in America is what's called cord-cutting? People deciding they don't want those sort of all-you-can-eat 
cable deals, uh, they want skinny bundles, or they want a kind of pick and mix model. Obviously, that's what the Netflix and Amazons are going to play to in this world. How much of a threat is that to uh, the model that you have built over so many well, years? Well, there have always been different packages of networks uh, in the US, different tiers, different distributors had different models for it, and we've played in all of those. And, uh, and, and, and the trick with the consumer, and, and I think in the U.S., some of the distributors have not been quick enough to provide consumers with what they want in terms of where they and how they can consume the network content. I think if you give a consumer a rich bundle of networks at a fair price, but with a lot of VOD capability, a lot of look-back capability, the ability to watch it on tablets, to watch it in the home, in the car, out, you know, wherever they are. Uh, it's, it's a tremendous package. And in the U.S., it's further bundled, as in many places in the world, with broadband. It's further bundled with uh, mobile phones. So, so overall, the, the value keeps increasing. People keep, keep uh, talking about disaggregation, but if you disaggregate, it actually gets more expensive to, to even put together a lesser package just because there's subsidization from multiple revenue sources when you have the bundle. There's subscription fees, there's uh, advertising, there's in many cases uh, other licensing and consumer products uh, revenues that are enabled by wide distribution. So it's a, overall, it's the best value there is. However, to get people into it, it's worthwhile having skinny bundles. And I was recently talking to uh, a, a distributor who talked about the fact as, that they've been able to get a fair number of upgrades from the skinny bundles as particularly younger people establish themselves more or start a family. So to get people into the ecosystem is a good thing. And uh, the deal I, I mentioned in my prepared remarks uh, that we entered into with Verizon involves um, a lot of our content that will be distributed along with data on uh, Verizon Wireless in the US, which is the biggest wireless carrier. It's an entirely new source of revenue for us. It's incremental. So we really don't care how our content is distributed as long as there's sufficient monetization. Monetization often requires proper measurement. So some of the ratings services that have been used in the US, in the UK, and elsewhere have not caught up with what technology allows. So in the US, the ratings service that we all depend on as the currency with advertising agencies today only measures viewing on a television screen. That must frustrate you, no? I'm sorry? It must frustrate you. It frustrates the us because, because this, it disproportionately yeah. hurts our company given that we have the largest portfolio and the largest reach of media networks uh, in, in the US, uh, but they're very, most of them are youth skewing they use more of these other platforms and they're not being measured right now. But there are now new ways of monetization and, and the ecosystem will catch up. So transitions can be difficult as you enter into that tunnel of transition. Yeah. We've been through many of them in our corporate history. The other side, in our view, will be much better than where we entered because we have the viewership we're beginning to monetize that viewership in more new and different ways. We're able to create in different ways. Our creative people are able to experiment with short form as well as long form. Um, we have tremendous social media reach and we are continuing to create products to monetize that, whether it's with advertisers, subscribers, or in the consumer products area. When we produce do, more animation, we have more consumer products. Uh, do you think your, do your investors get the rather rosy uh, story that you tell? Your stock price under a lot of pressure. Audiences have fallen for some of your uh, services. Advertising revenue is tough, as you say, down and difficult to measure. I mean, how tough is it when you're CEO to maintain um, this positive outlook when your shares price is going down and down and down? Well, uh, you have to look through. Uh, there, there are, you know, people start awfulizing uh, very easily uh, and, and they extrapolate trends uh, uh, as occurring very rapidly. They assume that uh, content companies have, that have been in business a very long time 
and have adapted over a very long time are not going to adapt. So there are a lot of assumptions built in. There's been a lot of volatility. In the middle of the summer, there's a big drop. We went to a low. As of right now, we're up 25% from where we were in the third week of August. So we went down a lot. We're still down, quite down for the year. But we look through that. And um, the important thing is for us to focus on what we do best, create great content, figure out how to distribute it in new ways, in new geographies. We are building an enormous international business where we have scale here in the UK. It's a launching pad to build scale elsewhere. We have scale in the best emerging market for media right now in India. And we're also distributing some of those networks in other countries. And we're looking ahead. We're not looking at to just next year. Africa, for example, is one when we're talking about a decade from now will be a very rich and lucrative media market. And we're making money there now, but that growth rate is going to be very high and be a significant number. So there are things that fade away and other things that become important opportunities for the future. And uh, we think that the stock market uh, uh, doesn't always see how you're going to end up in the long term. They're very short term focused some, sometimes. But the smart investors, those who bought three weeks ago, are feeling pretty smart already. So you know, old, old, old investors go out and new ones come in and they make money. I'm just very aware of the time. Uh, one final issue. Uh, you now own a public service broadcaster in the United Kingdom. Is the BBC as a commercial broadcaster a help or a hindrance uh, to your uh, broadcasting ambitions and to the broadcasting ecology of Britain and globally? Well, we have a lot of respect for the, the BBC and um, not just for hosting this uh, conference. Uh, they, they produce great programming and, uh, and I think uh, it uh, fulfills a very important function here in the, in the UK and, and actually around the world and is important to the public service broadcaster ecosystem. The only issue I have is where um, is that I think because it is government subsidized uh, or, or publicly subsidized that when it ventures into areas where commercial uh, media companies have invested a lot and it, and it goes away from the central mission, it's not that it shouldn't be permitted to do it, but it should be scrutinized. So if it uh, goes in to start a music network, for example, when, you ha when a company like ours has a long time investment in MTV, is that central to the mission? And that should be, what should be the limitations on that? So I think the, uh, I know there's a lot of talk about what should happen in multi-platform for BBC. It should move uh, along with, uh, with uh, the way the media ecosystem is evolving. So that's, that's the only quibble I would have. But I think it's a very valuable, valuable part of the ecosystem here. We're happy to be a part of it. And um, we will contribute to it. Uh, we are not only investing in the entertainment content, but we think we can beef up, for example, our news uh, service on Channel 5. And we're looking at that. I had a conversation with our people at Channel 5 about that this morning. So. Um, we're thrilled so to, the funding to, model is not a, a big issue for you in terms of the BBC being differently funded. Well, that's a political issue. That's a, that, you know, that's, that's, I'm, I don't have any expertise. I'm not going to land over here. And, uh, but I understand the history of it. I respect it. And the, uh, the only time that I would be concerned is where uh, there, there are new ventures, let's call it, which a lot of commercial media companies have invested in and put a lot of capital in the UK. Uh, to do, and, and, and then the question has to be posed, is it worth publicly funding those kinds of initiatives? Is it something that, uh, where there's a, a real need, or is that need already being filled yep. by those who have invested in the country? So if we launched a lip-syncing uh, competition program, you'd be, you'd be a bit annoyed. That, that would be off the mark. <laughs> Philip Dorman, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.